I give to you the American Museum of Natural History's very own Mark Coppenshaw. Yay! Yay! Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank Pretty warm up, but thank you for coming to this air conditioned room to talk about astronomy. Um, yeah, my name is Mark Popchak. I am a grad student at the Graduate Center in the City University of New York, um, but I also have a desk. I spend most of my days at the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, prior to getting my PhD, or starting my PhD, I worked in the education department there. So hopefully, this is going to be an engaging talk and my education training will pay off. <laughs> but we'll see. We'll see if I've learned anything. Um, I also am a part of the Brown Board of New York City, that's what that BDMYC is up there for. Um, it is a uh, research group at the museum run by Kelly Cruz, Emily Rice, and Jackie Faraday. Um, and I have to say all these things because these are the people who give me money. And now that I've said that, we can get to the science. Um, and so I kind of wanted to start with... Uh, I realized I didn't write the sexiest title or the sexiest abstract, so, uh, but this is kind of how I wanted to phrase this, or frame this talk, is how, how do you tell a, a, a star's age? If you just look at this image right here, uh, could you tell how old these stars are? Um, yeah, candles. Candles, yeah. <laughs> just hold candles as stars are. Um, well, you can't ask them uh, personal questions like that, so it's kind of the same question as if, how can you tell a person's age without asking them how old they are. You could uh, try and get information by looking at a bunch of different people and try and create a model. You could look at, for example, their height. You could look at their facial characteristics. You can see their hair color style. Maybe the number of teeth that might help you when they're younger. Um, but or older. without or older, <laughs> or older <laughs> sure. But uh, when you're asking, when you're trying to answer this question, if you can't ask them their actual ages, they're not going to give you an actual number. Uh, your best guess is to establish a model uh, using statistics and multiple age diagnostics. Uh, but in each individual case, you might not be exactly right. You're going to be able to get best guess by putting a lot of different things together, but uh, it's still just going to be a best guess. And so if we do that for stars, uh, what are those characteristics we can look at? We can't, they don't have faces, they don't have teeth, so what can we use? Um, and some of the, I'm going to list a few here. Uh, we can use the kinematics of the stars, how they're moving, uh, the magnetic activity of the star, the amount of flares that they're giving off at any over a period of time, and also their rotation rate. The rotation rate is bolded there because that's the one that we're gonna, I'm going to talk most about. There are other ones on here as well. For example, for our own sun, we know it's aged pretty well because of the uh, chemical isotopes that we can get from the meteorites in our own solar system. That's a little unfair. We can't get meteorites and samples from other stars, um, but we can compare our star to other similar types of stars there are many different ways of doing this, but these are the four that I want to focus on. Because um, why do we want to know these stars' age? And we're not actually going to be looking at uh, all the stars, but why do we want to know a star's age? What, what, what's useful about knowing a star's age? And part of what comes out of that is the question of habitability of the planets around these stars. Um, it's easy to think about the habitable zone as just being the distance from which uh, you can have liquid water around the star. We always draw it as this disk, but as a pet peeve of mine, it's really more of like a shell around the star. Of course, the, the plane of, of solar systems generally is just one set plane, but really the area that it is water could go all the way around the star. Um, but it's not just a question of the temperature. It could also be about the, the, the lifetime of these stars as well. If you think about Mars, it had liquid water on its ocean, or it had liquid oceans uh, for some part of its history, but it's lost that. And so if we know that there are planets around a star, if we know it's been around for a very long time, we might think that there it, is, it isn't habitable anymore. Um, I also want to make a point, I don't know everybody's background in this room, so I want to just make sure we get all the, the kind of basics, is that many stars are different. Um, we're going to construct a classic diagram, and you're going to see it more later in my talk, called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, where we're going to basically take this group of stars right here, we zoom in, uh, we're kind of cheating because we're saying that all the stars are in the same distance to us, um, and we'll talk more about distance and stars and why that's important uh, later, but this is uh, basically we're looking at this group of stars and now we're arranging it by color, we're putting the redder things on the right side of the screen and the bluer things on the left side of the screen. And then we're going to arrange by brightness as well, from top to bottom. The brightest things at the top, and the less bright things at the bottom. 
Um, and what we do pull out is this structure right here. And this is uh, a classic diagram in astronomy. And what happens here on this main sequence is basically the main lifetime of stars. When stars are happily burning hydrogen, uh, it's going to run through the other sections, but I want to, the main point I want to make is this happy lifetime in the main sequence. And specifically, uh, the redder type of stars on that main sequence. Down here, do I have a mouse? I do. Down here uh, are the types of stars, well, before they all go back to their proper places, uh, are the stars we're going to be talking about. And if you know the spectral types of stars, uh, if you know how, I mean, of course, I'm thinking a lot of you know the spectral types of stars, uh, they, they go by these archaic letterings, um, and so O are the biggest and the brightest and the shortest lived stars, while M stars over on the other end, these <coughs> low mass stars, are the, the, the less bright, the, the dimmest, I suppose, they're still pretty bright, um, and the coolest, but they also live for such a long time. Um, and so we, in my research group, focus, we're called the brown dwarf research group, so really brown dwarfs would be uh, over here on this kind of diagram, but we kind of push ourselves up into the low mass stars and we kind of push down into the planets as well. Um, so, but this talk is mostly going to be focusing about M dwarfs. And the reason that is, is because M dwarfs are very hot in the exoplanet field right now. Everybody's talking about M dwarfs. Forget Bitcoin, invest in M dwarfs. <laughs> because M dwarfs, their habitable zone is so much closer to the star because it's not as bright. It's far, far, far dimmer, and so to get enough incident radiation to have liquid water, you need to be much closer. And so this is the TRAPPIST-1 system for a scale up here. And so the TRAPPIST-1 actually has uh, nine planets, I think, at this point uh, around it. Oh, no, I think it's seven. <laughs> seven planets around it, three of which are rocky and in the habitable zone around the star. And this is a nice looking habitable zone, but on our solar system scale, they all fit very comfortably within the orbit of Mercury. So this is much, much closer to the star. And why that's important is it's actually easier, and I won't go into the whole details right now, but it's easier to find planets that are closer to their star. And so if we can find more of these planets, if there are many, many more M dwarfs, I maybe didn't mention that, but there are about 75% of the stars in the night sky, in the, in the galaxy are M dwarfs. Okay, so not all the ones you can see, the ones you can see are usually the brighter ones, but mm -hmm. there are loads and loads of M dwarfs. Um, so there are way more of them, that it's easier to find planets around them, because the, or habitable planets around them. And so Trappist has been in the news quite a bit because there are these three rocky planets, like I was saying, and they're in the habitable zone. But the lifetime, the longevity of the system is uh, a big question. It's, not, it's kind of hard to tell how actually old uh, Trappist is. Some say it's about 7 billion years or so, so uh, almost twice as long as the Earth has been around. So does it still have oceans on its planets? Who knows? Um, so just to kind of review this introduction, we, we want to know about a star's age because it has implications for habitability. Uh, we're focusing on M dwarfs because of their longevity and multiplicity. We're going to use various uh, multiple uh, age diagnostics, and it's going to be difficult to tell each star for certain, but we're going to get an idea from a statistical standpoint. Um, saying all this, it makes it sound like I've created a model that uses multiple age diagnostics. We're still working on that. That's what I'm going to be working on for my thesis. But, I'm going to focus in on one of these age diagnostics for the rest of my talk, the rotation rate. And I think it's a, a, a nice, uh, clear diagnostic that we can all pretty easily understand. So I'm going to quickly outline some of those other ones before I move on, uh, just show you one slide for each of them. Um, and then we're going to talk about how we actually measure the rotation rate of these stars, uh, how that is related to its age. We're going to look at some of the results that I've been able to uh, mess around with, and then look at some interesting cases because if there's anything you learn about science, is that you've got this great idea and there's always complications. Um, so, uh, talking about these age diagnostics for a star, the, the kinematics of a star, the basic idea is if you uh, start, your star starts in a big field of gas, kind of like the pillars of creation. We saw the Eagle Nebula earlier, which is cool. Uh, those were amazing uh, astro or, um, space photos earlier. I really was blown away by the human quality that you were all producing. Um, but if, if its star starts over here, somewhere in its, its big nebula, oh sorry, its nebula with all of its friends, uh, and then it maybe is part of a large cluster like this, over time during interactions with other stars, and maybe that's all happening in the, in the disk, the plane of the galaxy, over time interactions are going to kind of like kick it up or down or a little bit, or maybe move it up a little bit as orbiting around the galaxy. 
And so what we can actually do is if we take that plane of the galaxy, kind of edge on and put it sideways and look at it edge on, so to face on, you can see you can you can get a rough idea that stars that are right still in that plane of the galaxy are pretty relatively young, maybe only two billion years old. While the further away they get from that plane of the galaxy, they are going to be older and older. And that's because, again, of that random chance of another star coming by, kicking it up a little, kicking it down a little. Uh, and basically, anything that's well above the plane, you know it's pretty old. I mean, there's a, there is always a chance that something got really unlucky when it was being formed, and it got shot off by a big older brother or something, and it's now way up above the disk, and it's really not that old. But uh, statistically speaking, anything that is above the disk, uh, a halo object, is going to be much older than anything that's still in the plane of the disk. That's where a lot of the globs are, right? Or yes, globs. exactly. Um, and so uh, another thing is magnetic activity. We, we saw a, uh, a white light image of the solar surface a second ago, but this is a uh, H-alpha image on this side and white light on this side. And uh, the point is you can see the prominences here in the H-alpha really quite well. Uh, if we are able to look at a star and measure a, a higher signal of H-alpha than the normal or than other companions, we can know that it is still magnetically active, and at which point then we know that it's relatively young. The, the stars tend to calm down as they age, and so if we can get some magnetic activity from it, we know it's probably younger than other things. Uh, similarly, magnetic activity is also manifested in flares, um, and so you can measure the flare rates of these stars, you also know that it's magnetically active and therefore young. Uh, and then we get to the one what's, that... What's the flare rate measured in? Exactly. Flares per year, per month, per day? That is a great question, and we're going to get back to it later. I kind of ah. didn't describe it fully right there. Uh, so you've caught me. Jeez. Well played. Well played. <laughs> I am teasing you. <laughs> so let's talk about the rotation rates now, because this is something that I've been working on for the last nine months or so uh, in preparation for a paper. Um, and in the, the spacecraft that I, or the telescope that I was using is actually a spacecraft. It was the, uh, the Kepler spacecraft. It makes it sound like I was using it, like I was directing it. I'm not at all. I started this project after Kepler finished its mission uh, last year, but I was able to uh, still use its data. It was in the, the K2 mission, and for those who are unfamiliar with it, basically Kepler stared at one patch of the sky for four years, <coughs> one of its reaction wheels failed, then another reaction wheel failed, the redundant one failed as well, or rather there were four. You need three to be able to point in one direction, uh, but they only had two working, so they rather they pointed one direction, the butt towards the sun, and that actually works to stabilize it, and then use the other two wheels to point uh, in the other directions. So it was able to uh, still do science, but it had to limit its pointing so that its butt was at the sun. And so it had to look at fields along the ecliptic. Uh, so basically, always keeping its back to the sun, it could look at fields around there. And so it was able to do 19 campaigns over the course of uh, its secondary mission. And you can see it kind of traces out many of the uh, constellations of the ecliptic that I'm sure many of us here are familiar with. Um, and so while I was doing that, it spent about 80 days staring at each one of these fields. It overlapped a couple. Uh, this was a highly successful region here. Uh, it's great for me because I had we could look at stars that were visited multiple times. And at each of these regions, it measured uh, a light curve, which is a measure of the star's brightness over time. We were talking about occultations earlier. Uh, we were mentioning them, how that was over maybe a couple of seconds. Um, we're measuring this brightness of the star, uh, the flux from it, over hours or, or days, really. Um, and so. 80 days at each location, it would then measure its brightness uh, of that star over that time. And uh, the best way to, if this isn't immediately clear, I think the best way to look at it is in terms of how it was supposed to, uh, or the main science it was meant to do, which was to find exoplanets. And so when a planet passes in front of the star, we've got a nice star there, we've got a planet passing in front, the brightness of the star is level while the planet is not in front, but then as the planet passes in front, the brightness dips down until the planet passes out from uh, the front of the disk, and then it returns back to its normal brightness. And I like this picture a lot, but they, they tried to go for real realism here. If you look closely, that's trying to be, it's got like images of Jupiter on that planet, and they've actually drawn sunspots, or they've, they've included sunspots on this, this fake star. Um, but I'm annoyed because while they've included the sunspots, 
they haven't included the effect of the rotation of the star mm -hmm. and that star spot uh, going out of blocking the disk. And that's entirely what my research is looking at. It's looking at the, basically, rather than being flat right here, it should be a little curved. And to explain that, we're going to do our own little, make our own little uh, version of that graphic from before. So here we've got a rotating star uh, with some very big star spots. And that looks, may, might look like ridiculously large star spots, but for M dwarfs, that actually isn't so bad. You can get uh, M dwarfs with like 75% star spot coverage. It's more star spot than surface. Wow. Uh, because they are so magnetically active. So let's pretend though that we've got this, we've got three main star spots here. And if we kind of look at it, I'm, I've got the, the, the animation playing on the side here, but let's just take a few freeze frames from it. We could see that uh, maybe there's less star spot coverage on this side, so it's going to be generally brighter here. There's more star spot, there's maybe maximum star spot coverage, and then it phases back out, so that we're back to the, facing the same side, and we're back to maximum brightness. And so the, the brightness, over time then would look kind of like this curve. And if we could get multiple, so again, because it's the brightest, there's the least amount of star spots covering here, so the most star spots covering there, and it's the dimmest, and then back to the brightest over there. And if we get multiple rotations, we could get this, this nice repeating periodic curve. And that should just pop right out of the data. We're not gonna be able to see the phases like this. There is There are some people who uh, try and take the light curve data and then work backwards and try and create the, the star spot coverage. But what I'm looking at is mostly data that looks kind of like this, a periodic signal. Or maybe it looks more like this. This <laughs> is, so this is kind of like maybe continuous data. This is actual Kepler K2 data, where it's image every half hour or so. It takes an image, and so there's no scale for how bright it is over here, I'm sorry. But this is the, the time as we move over there. And so you look at this and you're like, I don't see any clear signal. Maybe there's something like going like here, perhaps, but nothing clearly sticks out. So then you run it through a periodogram and you say, computer, where do you see a signal, a periodic thing happening? And the, the computer finds a huge signal at about 0.3 days. And you say, that seems ridiculous. Let me put some lines on this data so I can see it at every 0.3 days. And it looks something like this, and it still really doesn't stick out to the eye. But then what we do sure is, it you see, you see it now, Dave. You yeah. see it now. I don't see it now. <laughs> and so to help me see it now, I'm going to basically take every one of those little segments that those lines have cut into. And I'm going to stack them all on top of each other to see maybe if I stack them all on top of each other, we'll see something kind of periodic. And when you do that, this is now every single one of those little segments stacked on top of each other. You do get out something, and this one's maybe not the best example. But you get a nice, or maybe not nice, but you do get some kind of structure to this right here. Um, and then you say, I don't want to make four plots every single time I do this, or three plots every single time I do this, so I'm just going to make it all into one big plot. And that's going to help me understand it. So this is the raw data down here. This is the, the computer, the periodogram again, saying this is the strongest signal I found. Uh, the lines for that strong signal, dividing it up, and then all stacked on top of each other right over here in the top right corner. So this is an example of one time where you really need the computer to help you out to search for the, the period. But there are other examples where it really kind of sticks out from straight from the eye. So here you can see very nice gradual curves, um, and they all stack each other really well. And again, all of these are pretty nice. Here you've got a double dip, so maybe you've got uh, two star spots, kind of opposite sides, and, or maybe a little bit offset. And so you kind of get uh, two dips and two, max, uh, two local maxima. And uh, over here, there's some, some weird variability or maybe some detrending issue there, but then it, it stables out and you get, again, all really strong signals. So uh, hopefully at this point you can see that uh, we can measure the rotation of these stars, but why is that important for its age? I started with age and now rotation, how do they combine? Well, there's a study of gyrochronology and uh, essentially we've got these stars that are spinning. They're spinning, they're spinning, they're spinning, uh, but what's gonna stop them from spinning? And what's going to stop them from spinning is going back to those flares again. Because as those flares are ejecting mass, uh, you've got to have kind of Newton's second law kick in. And as that energy is, is being shot outwards, maybe it's coming from the magnetic activity, but there still has to be an equal and opposite reaction. And what will happen over time is that because of all this activity, the interaction of these uh, ejecta and the magnetic field of the star, 
the star will start to spin down over its lifetime. And so uh, younger stars are going to be faster spinning, and they will slow down over time. Uh, they'll keep continue to spin, but you can get an idea of the age of the star by how quickly it is spinning. Uh, but before you can do that, you have to... That's almost hard to believe. That's almost hard to believe? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're talking about peanuts, about the mass of it being ejected. Right. But so, it's also a small, very small star. It's yeah, a very small star, but this, is, this, is, this tends to be true for bigger stars as well. And if you don't believe me now, that's totally fair, because I haven't shown you anything too convincing. But hopefully by the end of this talk, I will say, I hear your complaint, and I will uh, try and answer it. Uh, do me not complain. Complaint's a strong term. I hear your... your no, from, from Glasgow to complaint. <laughs> I hear your objection. Sustain. Sustain. Um, so, before we can learn more about these stars, uh, we have to kind of... Uh, or before we can talk more about the dark chronology, we have to know a little bit more about these stars. And to do that, we used another space-based telescope called Gaia. Um, Gaia revolutionized astronomy, and it really did just change everything about astronomy because it accurately measured the distances to over a billion stars uh, nearby. And a billion, how many were there before? About 100,000. 100,000 is what we knew really accurate distances to without having to individually measure them. And it did it through understanding the parallax, essentially uh, the nearby things. Uh, this isn't, well, it's going to be okay. The nearby things seem to move more as, as, the, as the guy's spacecraft moves around in its orbit. Essentially, to think about parallax, if you stick out your thumb right now and try and obscure my head, like hold my head with uh, your thumb. Crushing your head. You can crush my head, and then if you switch from one eye to the other, you'll see that, or you close one eye. I encourage you all, everybody, <laughs> please, point your thumbs up. I want to see everybody, give me a thumbs up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cover my head with one eye, and then switch to the other a eye. Pop and shock occultation. Yes, a pop, a pop occultation. Um, <laughs> And compared to background objects in the back, uh, they will the nearby stars will seem to move more or less. How accurate when they measure the Gaia, when they go back and, and check it against the, you know, the hundred thousand they have to figure anything about? That is a great how, question. How close were they? How close were they? So uh, the the errors on Hipparchos, Hipparchos was the, the European Space Agency spacecraft before that, before Gaia. Gaia is also run by the European Space Agency. Um, it has worse errors than uh, Gaia does, but it was still relatively good. My uh, research group is actually working on a project where we're trying to see, uh, it also measures the motion of these stars, the proper motion, like how they should be moving across the night sky over time. And if there's any inconsistencies with the proper motion that Hipparchos measured versus what Gaia measured, that might be because something's accelerating it, like an unseen planet. And so we're actually trying to find planets using astrometry which isn't a very common technique for doing that. Um, but getting back to the, that's a great question, thank you for asking it. Getting back to the, the topic on hand though, Gaia, like I said, over a billion position and brightnesses on the sky. Um, the parallaxes were amazing as well. It did, it did color information as well. And so um, it really helps to, to, to put all of the information we have on these stars into a larger context. And essentially, everybody can rewrite all the papers they wrote prior to Gaia Data Release 2 with Gaia again, and you'll just be that much better. Um, and people are doing that, so yay for scientists. Um, so, but getting back to our question about the ages, um, and, and does Gaia chronology really work? Uh, if we have all these stars at different ages, let's prove to ourselves that it does work by trying to find ones that are all roughly the same age. And to do that, we're going to try and find young objects. And so this is a uh, not-so-good image of Persepi. Or rather, I don't think it does it. Oh, just shut up, okay. Uh, of, of the Persepi cluster, and if you measure the rotation rates of all of these stars, and I'm focusing on the Endor stars, you get something that looks kind of like this. And so, to walk you through this, we have the, the brightness of the star over here. We're basically making that color magnitude diagram again. Here's the happy main sequence of all the, the living stars, all the main sequence stars, and here is the color which is just saying how hot they are. So the, the earlier M's, the M stars over here, uh, you've got uh, the other more massive stars down here, up, up there, and then the lower mass stars to get down over here. And the color code is by their rotation rate in a, uh, a log scale so that we can cover the whole range. And so essentially we've got about 200 or 100 day rotation rate in the yellow, 
and about a tenth of a day rotation in the light blue or the dark purple. Um, and so your, your question of, of how, how can this really be affecting these stars, um, the, the thing is this is about a 600 million year old cluster. And remember, these stars are forming nearby each other, but they're not really talking to each other at all. Again, in the Pillars of Creation, we've got stars forming here, here, and here. There's no way for them to really to talk to one another. Yet all the stars of the same spectral type, of the same size, all have about the same rotation rate. Uh, and so that really shows some kind of underlying physical constraint to the size of a star, all starting off at roughly the same rotation rate. As they as they form, uh, and again, you can see for any other kind of it, it, again, it's not perfect as we said that from the beginning. We're not going to be able to completely characterize every single star. But as you move from the lower mass stars down here up to the more massive ones, you can see for each kind of part on this main sequence, the color is a gradual shift down into the fastest rotators down here. There are outliers. Not saying there aren't. Um, in fact, right here is actually a binary sequence. These are probably binary stars that have um, a, a companion, and so they're a little bit brighter, and also their rotation rate, you can see, is kind of different than other stars of their type. So having a companion to, to speed you up or slow you down is going to change things. Um, and so I would say that uh, they're all starting from roughly the same point. And if the rest of solar mechanics is right, where they're going to be uh, having the same kind of magnetic field and the same kind of dynamo inside themselves, you would think this gyro chronology is going to continue for uh, being descriptive for the rest of their lives. So this is kind of cheating because we know they're all coming from the same cluster, all coming from the same place. Uh, I'll add on my data now, which includes objects from all over K2, and then you can see it starts to get pretty messy. Uh, there is maybe still some kind of a color trend up here, uh, but there's definitely certain objects that are, are kind of strange over here, which isn't too surprising. Uh, because this is a whole range of ages. We're not looking at just that, that the classic or the picture of the, the babies before. Now we've got a whole range of different ages showing up. Um, I'll point out though is that, uh, and, then, and then to make it even more confusing, here's a bunch of different data sets. <laughs> and you can see that the, the colors are, uh, maybe there are some trends here. The, this, yeah. this data set with the stars, these galactic <laughs> stars, anyway, these bright yellow ones here are quite a, uh, again, ye more yellow means a longer rotation. This is almost 100 days of a rotation rate right here. And they're found, uh, they're just kind of isolated objects that were found using a different telescope. And so they're kind of selectively going to be older. Um, but again, there are, there's, there's some structure to this. It's not just hodgepodge colors. It's not like speckled paints all over the place. There is some kind of, uh, of motion to the, to the color information on the color axis on this plot. Um, I'm not saying what I know exactly what, the, uh, what that motion is or how to describe it or how we would relate it exactly to the age of these objects, but the point is there is some physics going on here that can be um, followed up, and that's what I'll be working on for the next uh, two or three years. So if you invite me back in two or three years, I'll hopefully have an answer for you. Um, <laughs> But I wanted to kind of end my time by showing off a couple of the weird objects, uh, the weird things that can happen. I mentioned binaries before in that Persepi cluster. This is what it would look like for its light curve. You've got uh, the one, the, the maybe primary, I would say, uh, light source. And then on top of that are many little, little uh, period, periodic signals as well. And so you get one large signal here at 25 days, but then also a small one one right around one day as well. Um, and this is just one example that really sticks out. Uh, there are a bunch of other ones. They might not show up too well, but this one's a, a triple system. And so the, I think the image to look at is here. You can kind of see when they're all stacked on top of each other. You've got that nice sine curve, that nice periodic signal. Here you can see it. This is now at a different uh, time this for this signal right here. You can also get a nice periodic signal. This one's a little rough to look at, but if you squint your eyes a little bit, you can convince yourself that, that is a nice kind of wave right there as well. Um, going back to the flares, how would we measure the flares? If you look here again, we've got a nice periodic signal, but there are these kind of hiccups and burps right here where the star is flaring. And so here the flare rates are measured uh, in events over this campaign, perhaps. 
Um, and so this one is a very active star, even though a, a relatively longer rotation period. So I'm not exactly, I don't remember the, the spectral type of the star, but this one would certainly be an interesting one to look at. And again, you can kind of see the little burps of the flaring. As the emission comes off the star, it gets generally brighter. Um, and again, this is what it would look like <laughs> with the flare coming off. There's, a, there's an increase in flux at that right moment. And M dwarf flares are much stronger than, um, than the flares around our star, uh, relative to its brightness, I should say. Um, you could also have eclipsing binaries uh, show up. And so what's happening here is uh, there is this nice periodic signal, strong signal coming out of the periodogram. But when you look at it, there are these big dips right here where the other star is passing in front. Here's another example. Um, and so as one star passes in front of the other, you see a dip as it's getting blocked. It's very similar to the transit method, except both of these things are contributing to the total flux from the, the, the telescope sees. But as one passes in front of the other, you see the dips. And just so you can see it again, there would be dip one and dip two, and dip one and dip two is over here as well. Uh, this is an interesting thing. This is the idea of differential rotation, where the star spots aren't all on the same latitude on the star. We see this in our own sun. The, the rotation of the sun at different latitudes uh, changes. And so around the equator, it's, it's at a certain speed. And over at the poles, it's different. Um, and so what's happening, likely, is that there are some star spots at the slower region that are causing this overall brightness. And then at a, a closer and near a shorter period region that are causing this more periodic signal. Um, and what's strange is that this is like a factor of 10 difference, like 20 days to here and then every two days right there. Um, and so this, is, this would be a pretty dynamically different star. Um, and it might not even just be individual star spots on these objects. They're, they're, they might have whole bands, like star spot bands on them. So it gets pretty confusing. Um, the future of this field, though, is in a different spacecraft than Kepler. It, it ended its K2 mission and was uh, deserviced. They basically turned it off. Um, but the next, the next spacecraft is called TESS. And TESS is going to find many, many planets around Ambrose. That's why I told you to buy M dwarfs, because TESS is designed to find M dwarfs. The, the footprint of K2, so this is the footprint of the Kepler mission, and then the K2 mission. Uh, were these yellow uh, rectangular objects, but the blue regions are where TESS is going to look. Um, it's finishing, each one of these is called a sector, and uh, it's finished up about uh, half, I think it's actually finished the, this lower hemisphere of the, the night sky, um, the southern hemisphere, and it's going to start working on the northern hemisphere pretty soon. Um, and the darker blue is where it's only going to look uh, for one sector, but Sometimes the sectors overlap, and that's why there's lighter and even lighter blue over there. Um, so I guess I wanted to end there, uh, talking. We talked about the guy chronology of studying star age from its rotation rate. Mentioned this long-term plan we had in our research group to make uh, look at these multiple age diagnostics to find a way to to accurately or as accurately as we can date these stars. Um, I talked about some of the strange things. I just wanted to highlight that the, at the museum we have a lot of cool uh, education programs where they can where high school students uh, can work with actual scientists. So that's part of the science research and mentoring program. These are our students from, uh, that worked with our cohort. Um, and so uh, if you have anybody who's interested in uh, doing astronomical data and are able to get down to the museum, uh, I should definitely suggest looking at that. And if anybody's in, uh, in New York City and wants to learn more, do more astronomy outreach, I'm also part of Astronomy on Tap uh, in New York City, and that's a really cool an outreach event at a bar. Um, so if you have any questions about that or any of the anything that I talked about today, uh, I'd be happy to field your questions and thank you all for listening. Yeah. Cool. Well I got a question. So if uh, this is a little outside of your realm too, but if you were trying to find exoplanets and you were looking at these these small stars that have these giant sunspots on it that I've never heard of about that before. How would you be able to tell, looking at you know, light dips, that there's a planet there instead of that it's just a giant sunspot? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I think that the, uh, the shape that star spots have, let's find a nice one. The shape that star spots have on a um, 
light curve versus the shape that a, a planet has are very different. Um, so if there is just one big star spot, that's probably the case here. It's this long, uh, drawn-out affair that takes, uh, this is a 22-day uh, cycle right yeah, here. Right. Um, while a planet, if it's got, let's estimate, a circular orbit, it's only going to be transiting right when it passes in front of us. So let's say that's 100, 1 100th one on as an estimate of its orbit. So its, it's, uh, it's transit signal is going to be very sudden. And it's also going to be more V-shaped. If we look at that animation back through the babies, there we can go like this. Oh, the wrong thing. If we look at this, can you pause it now. Uh, the edges of it are very sharp during the ingress and the egress mm -hmm. um, because it's it's almost like a geometric problem. It's not uh, well. It would still kind of maybe be the same for the star spot, but it would be much slower. And so this is a very sudden thing, this sharp dip right here, a plateau, and then a sharp dip there. This is more like a, a U, perhaps, versus uh, what a star spot is, where it's very much like a wave. <coughs> yeah. I understand. Yeah, no, that's a perfect example. And we can kind of see it with the, uh, a, a planetary transit would look more like the eclipsing binaries did. Sorry, I lost my mouse. There it is. Uh, kind of like here, and that's why eclipsing binaries uh, are sometimes thought to be planets as well, because this would be this would be kind of like your planet signature right there, a very sudden dip like that. Um, but it turns out this is definitely an eclipsing binary. Yeah. Do you expect to see spectral differences as well? Spectral as differences. The, you're talking about large spots. Obviously, not yes. 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 In order to see any kind of fall, so would you? Also expect to see from the diet, what the diet is, um, and more respectful data. Would you expect to see changes indicating chemical composition changes in uh, terms of what you're reviewing, or is that yeah. too subtle? No. So that so I mentioned that this was this this animation is what I used to explain star spots, but this is actually uh, a group. I believe they're at, at uh, the Astronomical Institute in Potsdam. Um, but they are trying to do just that. Uh, I've actually obscured the rest of their, their graphic actually has a spectral line down here that is changing with the star spot. Um, and I've just completely masked it out so that I can make everybody focus on the star spot. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's exactly what they're trying to do. They're trying to take the changing spectral information and then go backwards from that into uh, reconstructing the surface map. Yeah. That's good. And that's, and that's a really, yeah, they're doing some pretty cool stuff. They came and gave a talk. And, Blown away by that. Yeah. Any other questions? It, if you look at where these small stars are, yes. Um, in, let's say in our galaxy itself, mm -hmm. you look at globular clusters. Are, are they, is the population of small stars in that different than the rest of the galaxy? That's a great question. Um, my advisor, Jack Perry, likes to say that. Uh, every end dwarf that was ever born is still alive because they're just they just live for trillions, trillions of years. Right? Trillions of years. That's how long they'll be happily on that main sequence burning hydrogen. They hardly burn anything. So are they are they still burning? They are still burning hydrogen. Yeah. So you could find them in globular clusters, but they're going to be very faint. Generally, globular clusters are a little bit further away. Um, you can you can find them pretty much in, in any direction. They're they're everywhere. They're like copper. Well, they're not like copper. Sorry, I live in New York. Uh, they're they're all over the place. Uh, they they anywhere you look, if you could see down to the brightness that they are, you you'll be able to, to find them. Um, they they whenever there is star formation, they're going to be the majority of, or there's going to be a lot of them. The the mass function of stars kind of peaks at M five. So the majority of the mass, if you think about it like a big cloud of gas, only a little bit of it's going to go into the big brightest stars, and actually a lot of it's going to be it's a lot easier to make small, many small things. And so the mass function peaks at M5. The majority of the mass of a star forming region goes into making M5 stars. What's an M5 star? An M5 star is a type of uh, M, M star. star. Yes, sorry. Uh, we have this lovely system where we divide up like this, but then within each of these, uh, there's generally a spectral type from 0 to 9 for each of them as well. Okay, so, so there's what is 5. Yeah, so M0 is. Uh, after K9, and then you go M0 all the way down to 5, 
by mass peak down to M9, and then you get into the brown dwarf region. Is the population of binaries the same? Yeah, That's more a good More binaries in the M's than there are in the B's? I think, uh, I, I, I'm not sure that number off the top of my head, uh, but I imagine there are a lot of M dwarf binaries. I can't speak to that fully right now. Yes? Is there any difference when you go down into the brighter brown dwarfs with regards to rotation rates, like the, the bright class L's? That's a really good question. Like I know the class K, a lot of the dim L's and the, and the T's and of course the nearly unobservable Y's are probably more similar to planets than stars in terms of probably their They're like hot Jupiter's at that point, right? Yes. But, you know, the L class ones are almost, they're pretty close to being actual stars. Yeah. So I wonder what that would be like now. That they, uh, actually, so I saw that you have Johanna Voss, who is one of my uh, group mates. She's actually in that photo at the end. Um, she's coming to speak in a few months, yep. and I'm sure she'll. Uh, she's actually leading some summer students on variability of brown dwarfs right now. Um, and so yeah, they, they're looking at shorter uh, rotation periods, on, like hours, uh, not so much as days. Um, but uh, they do. They are bright enough that you can see them in Kepler. Um, and so I would definitely save that question for her when she comes to okay. talk. Yeah, because to me, like the the weird boundary area. Brown dwarfs and red dwarfs, I would wonder what, what it is like. Like, once you get rid of the height of confusion, is the rotation rate such Yes. Um, and in fact, once you get past uh, M4, the four, yeah, M4, you're kind of fully convective anyway, and so brown dwarfs are fully convective. So uh, a lot of the, the, the internal well, structure. The starts at that dim. I thought it started like M1 or M2. Fully convective, a fully convective star, the cutoff is generally around M4. Yeah, and four onwards, the star is fully convicted. Which is, is part of why you see this kind of spread right here. Uh, these are all kind of the same, uh, they all have a, a same, similar structure, and then the convection cutoff is happening right here, and that maybe is why this, there's this discontinuity in the color suddenly right there. Uh, that's a theory. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. At what distance we can see sense the <coughs> star spots? I mean, how far can we go from the scene? Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's so Kepler, the, the original Kepler field is like, they have stars that are a couple thousand light years, or a thousand light years away. So it's a question of how long you're going to, like how good your telescope is. And how long you can look so, at well, it. Well, yeah, that's so actually, far. So is, is, that, is that what your question is asking? My question is that, uh, you know, at certain point we're not gonna be able to see the, um, you know, so what's the current ability to see how far? A long years. distance record, kind of. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to see spots on a star. Uh, so again, we're so we're not the 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 data we're getting is more like this, right? We're seeing the the signal of the star spots, but not necessarily star spots themselves. Okay. Um, when you're trying to to maybe map something kind of like this, uh, these things are much closer because they need to get a good enough resolution and uh, time resolution to be able to uh, to look at these things. Yeah. So so the actual mapping of the star spots uh, are is, is limited to more nearby stars. Right. Yeah. Yes. This is gonna sound stupid, but adding to that question, um, what's like the dimmest magnitude stars that you're typically looking at with Kepler with Kepler data for star spots? Um so I imagine that has that Yeah. We're having stars. problems with stars that are dimmer than Kepler magnitude, which is an optical magnitude of eighteen. Um, oh, but that's absolute. No, that's Kepler. Yeah, so that's Kepler. So it can do down to 18th magnitude reliably. I would say 18th is like, yeah, our border. Yeah, that is. That's it's impressive. Dim. That's dim. <laughs> that's that's dim. Cool. Yeah. Great. Thank you all again.